Hello, I'm Abdul Saad, clinical psychologist at Vital Mind Psychology here in Sydney, Australia. And I'm coming to you with the third installment in this series on the spiritual dimensions of narcissism, looking at uh, false image and shame. Love of image is perhaps the quintessential feature of narcissism recognized by almost everyone. Narcissism promotes a love of self or more specifically a love of a particular image of the self. In grandiose expressions of narcissism, this aggrandized self image is one of an exaggerated sense of self importance, of prowess, superiority, brilliance, competence and greatness. In more vulnerable or covert expressions of narcissism, this aggrandized self-image is inverted but is narcissistic nonetheless. An exaggerated sense of wounding, sensitivity, undiscovered brilliance or even piety and morality. As Jungians say, depressives are not immune from narcissism and in some instances, uh, chronic depression can be linked to unfulfilled grandiosity. At both extremes of these narcissistic variants, the image reigns supreme, cannot be criticized and must prevail. As a rule of thumb, the grandiose narcissist cannot be humbled and the vulnerable narcissist cannot be helped. One is puffed up, inflated and refuses, refuses to deflate and realign with reality. And the other is deflated, morose, enduring, masochistic, resisting help and defeating those who try an inverted inflation, if you like. Now, what is hiding behind the mask of this false image? Uh, is, uh, be it an aggrandized image or a, uh, a puffed up image or a denigrated image, what's hiding behind this, this image uh, are deep feelings of shame. The false self, the idealized image, is a cover for the pain of chronic shame, which is created through repeated experiences of disconnection with a significant other or others during one's childhood and formative years. Patricia de Young, in her excellent book, Understanding and Treating Chronic Shame, provides the following helpful and clinically relevant definition of shame. Shame is an experience of one's felt sense of self, disintegrating in relation to a dysregulating other. When we are at our most vulnerable, our experience of being an integrated self depends on the emotional attunement or regulation we receive from those closest to us. A dysregulating other is someone close to us whose emotional responses leave us feeling fragmented instead. What is elegantly captured in this definition of shame is the centrality of relationships and how our sense of self is co-created through our earliest relationships. We are relational creatures and shame occurs when we experience a kind of paradise lost, a loss of self, a fall from grace in the presence of a significant other who through their responses to our signals that we are bad, wrong, defective, unworthy, broken, unlovable, leaving us to feel disorganized, fragmented and disorientated. Now, it's my belief that the human ego is itself essentially narcissistic, again, on a sliding scale from less severe to most severe. And why is it narcissistic? Because it's disconnected from essence, disconnected from source or divinity. And how does this process of disconnection occur? It occurs through the very process of becoming incarnated into this world, experiencing the normal course of ruptures and misattunements with our parents, caregivers, siblings and peers, which over time shape 
the personality to take on a particular defense strategy. So this doesn't mean that we are all pathologically narcissistic, but the human ego and the personality defense strategy that develops as a result of the inevitable wounding we all, we all go through, because none of us have perfectly attuned parents, um, means that we all suffer from some disconnection from our essence, disconnection from our true self. And what uh, is created in place of that is a false self, which is by definition narcissistic. So as I said, the reality is none of us had perfectly attuned parents and all of us experience some degree of rupture, of shame, of paradise lost with significant others. Ruptures that were not adequately healed or repaired. And through this repeated process, we develop the scar tissue that goes on to form our personality structure. <clears throat> Those deeply ingrained and fixated patterns, habits of attention and behaviors, which we use to navigate the world and keep at bay painful feelings. <clears throat> In the more severe forms of narcissistic pathology, we typically see more extreme and repeated experiences of shaming, which leads to a disintegration to the sense of self, which is defended against through the development of a false self-image. Individuals who go on to develop narcissistic pathology invariably have, have experienced repeated interpersonal injury of a shaming nature. Now, one of the core features of our personality defense strategy is our idealized self-image. In someone with narcissistic pathology, the, the idealized image of themselves, their self-image, has become so all-encompassing, occupying so much space, needing so much attention, that it stifles and suffocates the very life out of that person. It is the sacred cow that must be worshipped, revered, paid homage to. But it is hiding a deep pain and emptiness that stops the narcissistic individual from making real contact with themselves and with others. The mask, the image, the persona, the false self shields one from pain, but at the high price of disconnecting one from the heart. And this is why people completely possessed by their own image find it so difficult to feel empathy, to feel true connection and contact with others. We're in the, we're in the presence here of an emptiness, a hollowness, a deep emotional austerity, and so often a humorlessness for the self-image has become too puffed up, taking up so much space within the inner kingdom taking itself so seriously that it leaves little room for much else other than its own self-aggrandizement and self-worship. It has become an idol, a false god needing constant validation so it does not crumble under the weight of its own absurdity. So when we are possessed by the extreme forms of image, false image, we have entered into a process of claiming attributes, privileges, and virtues, which we do not possess purely by virtue of our own accomplishments. For example, the medical practitioner or the therapist possessed by a God complex attributes to his or her individual personal self, all of the collective attributes which make up the archetype they are accessing, that of the healer. But no matter how brilliant a doctor, therapist, or healer may be, and I'm using this as an example, no matter how brilliant a doctor, a therapist, or healer may be, she or he must recognize that this brilliance is something working through them. They are manifesting an archetype, which is part of the collective consciousness of humanity, which they are privileged to access but they are not the archetype itself. But we see in more narcissistic pathology, there's a personal identification 
with the archetype and often uh, uh, arrogating to the self the attributes or the virtues associated with a particular archetype. So narcissism leads to an archetypal inflation where we become possessed with the mistaken belief that it is us, our personal self, our own brilliance that is the reason for the success or impact we may be having, that it, that it is only us. In this way, narcissism and false image causes us to exceed bounds, overstep limits, to make claims we are not entitled to make, and to fail to give thanks and attribution to those upon whose shoulders we stand upon. The narcissistic ego, possessed by its own greatness, arrogates to itself a godlike quality, refusing to acknowledge that it owes a debt of gratitude to others, that in of itself it can create nothing. It can only take what is given to it and make something from it. Only God, in theological and philosophical terms, only God has the attribute of being a necessary being, existing independently of anyone or anything. And only God creates things out of nothing. Creation ex nihilo. Everything else is borrowing from the light of divinity. Everything else is dependent and is in a constant state of dependency. There is only one necessary being, the unmoved mover. Now, we see in the, uh, both the biblical and Quranic narratives, the archetypal story of paradise and paradise lost, of connection and disconnection in the story of Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve occupied this paradisal abode, a realm that was otherworldly, a world which was innocent, a world which was free of limitation, pain and grief. And although the fall has different theological and soteriological interpretations and implications, meaning it's has different, it's given different meanings in terms of its significance, in terms of how we understand God, how we understand human nature, how we understand salvation in the context of the three great monotheisms. Although the fall has different theological and soteriological interpretations and implications, the central theme is that we are born, the central and common theme is that we are born into a world of limitation of relativity and to some degree of disconnection from divinity through the process of of incarnation, through the process of coming into the world, being born into the world. Our life arc, our life journey is to return to where we started with the deep inner knowing of divinity that we had before we incarnated. Our narcissism disrupts, arrests, and contaminates this process. Our task from this psycho-spiritual perspective is to ascend the levels of consciousness, which take us back to where we started, to the original knowledge of divinity, which is what we see in the eyes of infants and very young children, that sparkle in their eyes, that innocence, yet to be fully burdened by their personality defense strategy, and the self-image attached to it, and the inevitable process of experiencing those ruptures, which often go unhealed or are inadequately healed or repaired. So in the spirit of this series, we are where we are encouraging compassionate self-reflection and loosening the tendency to blame and shame ourselves and others, we can begin to reflect on where our own... Um, narcissism, our own identification with an idealized sense of self or or image resides, turning our attention again, not in self-condemnation, but in the spirit of working through our identifications with particular aspects of our image to release us from their bondage, from their stranglehold, to become liberated and to be able to connect with ourselves through our authentic self through our authentic heart, through an open heart, 
and not through a two-dimensional representation of our heart center, uh, which is uh, which which basically becomes which is substituted for an image, a two-dimensional image, an idealized sense of self that's hiding that underlying pain. So I look forward to seeing you at the next installment in this series on the spiritual dimensions of narcissism, God willing. Uh, I'm working on this series piecemeal. Um, these are uh, thoughts and content which I'm putting together as we go along on this journey. And I'm really not sure exactly where this is heading. I don't have a, uh, an end point in sight, but let's, let's keep going. Let's keep up the conversation, keep up the dialogue. Let me know in the comment, comment section how you're finding the series um, so far, this being the third installment, any reflections, any comments, uh, any um, ideas you want to contribute. Um, I would be very keen to uh, get feedback from you. Um, I hope that you are doing well wherever you are in the world. And until next time, which hopefully will not be too long, um, Look after yourselves and each other. Take care. Bye-bye.